Well, thank you, Phil. I really appreciate that. And uh, I want to congratulate you for your leadership on this, um, both in introducing the first bill back in 2002 when, ironically, I was a city forester at that time. Um, and we talked a lot about the good old days, I guess, uh, yesterday when we were chatting about this. And, you know, there is a desire to increase the canopy um, of the District of Columbia. The administration, the Fenty administration, started it off uh, by setting a 40 percent tree canopy goal. Uh, we have a lot of information today that we didn't have back in 2002. And one of the interesting things is that we're finding from some aerial photos that we've been uh, looking at that we know uh, back in 1950, give or take, there was about 45 percent tree canopy. Today we know that there's 35 percent. The real strange thing is in 1950, for those of you who've been in the district for that long, you know how many people there were? 800,000. So you would think that with more people, you would have less canopy because of more infrastructure needs. Well, actually, the reverse is what we're finding is true. Today, there's 600,000 people, was 550, and there's 35 percent tree canopy. So something's happening. Our needs for infrastructure are growing. And let's face it, the one thing that trees need is dirt. And if we can't get that dirt, then the trees are not going to grow. And D.C. has a rich history of trees, and I think all of us here are a testament to the fact that we really need to hold on to that history, whether it's Boss Shepard, who you passed walking in the door, who planted 70,000 trees back in the late 1800s, or the Macmillan plan, which was cutting edge and still uh, we're beneficiaries of that today, and so on and so forth. So that's just kind of a, a primer of kind of where we're at here uh, in the district right now. But Phil talked about increasing canopy and how can the law help us in, in trying to achieve that. The law, as it was first passed, was very, very good. It was one of the best laws, I think, in the country that I knew of. Um, we had a little bit of heartburn on the size of the tree. But simplicity in any kind of legislation is key. And for anybody who has to either administer or enforce the law or has to respond to it as a homeowner or a resident, it's really important that people understand what the law is and what it's trying to achieve. As, as council members said, the law does not preclude anyone from removing a tree. So it's not really a protection of trees, but it does discourage the removal of trees because now it treats trees as, an, as a, not just an amenity, but as something that's important. And it's really nice to see George Hawkins here today because as George well knows, trees do what, George? They slow storm water, and that's what you're all about. And so it's really interesting to see how this issue over time has grown in importance, not just because trees are beautiful and they shade our streets, but because they provide countless environmental benefits. And I think the law, despite its foibles, has really set a stake in the sand in terms of people understanding the importance of trees and why we need to preserve them. So we've kind of sat down and thought a little bit about <clears throat> those issues, and we've come up uh, with a bunch of uh, what we would say proposed amendments to, to the, the bill that uh, Councilmember Mendelson has put forward. Um, and the first is to reduce the size limit for trees covered by the Act from 55 to 29 inches in circumference. We base that solely on a scientific viewpoint. If you look at, and I think this is in, your, um, in the, the papers that we put out, if you look at the trees from 29 inches to 55 inches, those are kind of like the trees of tomorrow. That's the healthiest cohort of trees out there in the urban forest. And when I say urban forest, let me just make a statement about that. I'm talking about all of the trees in the district, the 2.5 million trees that grace our city. Okay, So those trees within that, um, those diameter ranges between 29 and 55 inches in circumference are those healthy, strong trees you see in a lot of people's yards. Okay, There's no discouragement of removal that's provided to those trees in the current bill. Um, and while I understand what the council member is saying in terms of how many trees are we going to have to inspect, how simplistic will the bill be, should we go to 40 inches, I think those are things that we can discuss and come to some uh, agreement upon. Right now, uh, from the data that we receive via our FOIA, which we ask from DDOT every year, there were 650 inspections that, were occur that occurred last year. That might go up to 1,200 or 1,000 if we reduce that size limit. It's kind of hard to say at this point, but it will require an increase in administration from that standpoint. So it's a balancing act. Um, we're very, very pleased about uh, the council members' um, uh, proposal to increase the replacements by 1.5 times, and that, that in and of itself may get us to where we need to go if we don't decrease the limit to the 29 inches that we're proposing now. So that's just something to think about in terms of 
how many trees should the law uh, encompass. The second recommendation, modify the mitigation alternatives for trees removed under the UFPA to an exclusively fee-based system. We say this simply, well, we say this for a lot of different reasons. Number one is, I think all of you here have planted a tree, okay? It's not an easy thing to do, and it's not an easy thing to do right. It's like green roofs, right, Peter? Everybody says, I can put up a green roof. Well, I see green roofs growing naturally in Italy. It's just moss on top of a red tile roof. But for, unfortunately, it's not like that here in the United States. And when you plant a tree, you've got to monitor it and maintain it for three to five years before that really becomes established in the urban landscape. People who say, I will plant this tr these trees, and it may be 10 or 15 or 20 replacements, run into a whole host of issues. Number one, jurisdictional. Where am I going to plant those trees? knocking on neighbors' doors, do you want a tree? Do people say no? Of course they don't. Sure, I'll take a tree, no problem. Will they maintain it? 90% chance that they won't. Plant it between the curb and the sidewalk. What's the worst place to plant a tree in the District of Columbia? In a tree coffin. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyway, there's many, many issues around allowing homeowners to plant trees that are not professionals in the industry. And this is not to try to you know, preserve the union of arborists, believe you me. But what it is trying to do is to make sure that those trees are planted and maintained. And I'll just put a little tidbit. In the audit of the Urban Forestry Administration's um, administration of the tree bill that happened by the D.C. government, and I quote, it says, UFA also feels that having a planting component is not effective in the UFPA, and it should be all payments in lieu of tree removal. This is a more efficient, more efficient and effective for staff and for the district. UFA has requested the ability to change the UFP for FA, FY12 with the mayor for that particular item. And those are the people who do this currently. They're saying that we cannot act as a third party to allow people to plant trees because it takes so much time and so much energy. And if you actually added up all the dollars in staff time, you could probably plant another 10 trees. So we want to try to make that a little bit more streamlined. Uh, we understand that there may be an issue that will come up. Let's say somebody removes a 55-inch tree in their front yard. That could be the entire front yard canopy. And they say, well, gosh, I want to plant one more tree back on my yard. That's something we can think about. How do we accommodate that rational request, I would say, but also make sure that the remainder of the trees that are planted throughout the district, as they're supposed to, get done in a way that makes sense. Recommendation number three, update the fee structure from $35 uh, per circumference inch to $40. 2002 ain't 2012. Simple. Uh, what we paid for a planted tree back then is not what it is now. And what we're trying to say here is that inflation happens to everyone. We all know that our dollars back then are not worth our dollars now. And so we need to keep up with that. Our recommendation, furthermore, is to put that not in the law but in regulation because if we have to change the law every time that that fee changes, we're going to be sitting here. And as much as I love everybody in this room, this is a little bit of a painful process, let's face it. So uh, let's try to put that in regulation. Specify within the Urban Forest Preservation Act where replacement trees must be planted on private lots when trees are removed from private lots and on the public space when they're removed from the public space. Why is that the case? Well, let's think about this. For many, many years, um, well, that doesn't make any sense, but we have a, an idea that a lot of the tree fund monies are being used to plant trees on the street sides. I mentioned earlier, what's the worst place to plant a tree between the curb and the sidewalk? Street trees are beloved, and we need them. And the city, through the Urban Forestry Administration, needs to continue its commitment to maintain its tree canopy. And the Urban Forestry Administration's uh, mission, and I'll, and I'll put it out to you, DDOT Trees is the Urban Forestry Administration which is responsible for establishing and maintaining a full population of healthy street trees within the district, okay? I really don't feel that the tree bill was ever intended to take monies from trees that were removed from private properties and the fees that go into that to subsidize the Urban Forestry Administration, and I think most of you would agree with that. Be that as it may, if a utility company needs to remove a special tree on the street side, or in a park, I think those money should go back to the district to replace those trees within the public space. But I think we need to be very careful about where monies come and go because the Tea Partiers, of which I am not one, will say it's just another tax. And in this case, they may be somewhat right. As opposed to taking those tax dollars and using them wisely to keep up programmatic things, they're taking dollars that are really geared toward doing other things and they're putting them into something else. Um, 
again, the, the law was never envisioned as a way to supplement basic city budget expenditures, and we want to try to avoid that. Recommendation number um, five, allow city inspectors the ability to deny permits for individuals seeking to remove a tree if the re reason given is arbitrary. Phil had mentioned this earlier, and I don't disagree with his reasoning. How do we keep this simple? I've been a field arborist in my past career for more than a decade, many decades actually. People will come up to me and say, I want to remove this tree because I don't like the leaves or I don't like the color. It may be a gorgeous tree in the prime of its life. And what is that median? I don't know what that is. That's something that we'll all have to discuss and figure out. But if somebody needs to remove a tree because they're expanding their home or I, I don't know what the other reasons might be. But can we establish some kind of a structure within which you can say, well, within the structure, yes, you can remove this tree. Within the structure, no, you can't. Or do we just make the disincentive that horrible that somebody's not going to remove it because it's going to cost three or four or five thousand dollars? I don't know what that balancing line is. I think that's. I think we need more discussion on that. But I think it is doing a disservice to the community and to the neighborhood if we say, yes, you can remove that tree because you don't like the color of the leaves. And that's not an unreal uh, question that many people will ask. Recommendation number six, streamline the inspection procedure to reduce burdens on city staff by relying on third-party inspectors. <coughs> Again, we understand the council member's point on this. Last night I went, after our uh, very good discussion, um, and talking about Latin names for trees, which are really not Latin. That was kind of an interesting <laughs> discussion. Acer saccharinum, saccharinum, and saccharum. Uh, <laughs> went back, and I looked at the number of trees that come through. And again, last year, 2010, there were 600, uh, 650 trees that were requested. Um, about 300 of those were hazardous, and the remainder were for replacement. I don't have the statistics in front of me right now. My sense is, given that number, a staff of three or four full, dedicated full-time staff could do a reasonably good job with this program, okay? Now, in UFA, as, as Councilmember Mendelson mentioned, the tree bill enforcement is kind of an ancillary thing for those folks. They get thousands of calls every month about the street trees, and you've probably made some of those calls. I've made some of those calls. All of our constituents do. It's everything from there's a squirrel in my tree to the, the, the line is arcing, and they've got to respond to each one of those. So you take all those calls, and then you take all the calls for the trees for removal, and you, you have a, basically a bear of a workload. Okay? If we can separate those things out, I think you would have a reasonable workload for the folks who do this, in particular at DDOE, which is our last recommendation. I'll speak about this in a moment. But if you have those two things commingled, you're going to have problems, and we see those problems. And even the Urban Forestry Administration, individuals who I've spoken to off the record have said, and they shall remain unnamed, yeah, take this thing. It's okay. Take it. Our mission is to restore, <laughs> is to have a full population of street trees. It's not to go off lot. It's really, it doesn't really make sense in the grand scheme of things. Which brings me to recommendation number seven. Create a division with DDOE to monitor, enforce, and administer the UFPA along with the tree fund to ensure that the act and the tree fund are achieving their intended purposes. What is that intended purpose? Very, very simple. If a tree was removed, replacements are planted, hopefully on private lots more than on the public space simply because of the fact that trees planted on the private lot, especially if that lot owner is asking for a tree, has a much better chance of survivability than a street tree. And I'll refer back to the DDOE um, uh, uh, legislation that created it back six years ago. Um, and on page two, uh, it says, um, District Department of the Environment is an agency within the executive branch of the District of Columbia government to consolidate the administration and oversight of environmental laws, regulations, and programs into a single agency. And it further goes on to mention um, to take on current performed duties related to the environment, um, existing agencies, programs, departments, administration, boards, or commissions implementing, administering, or enforcing federal or district laws relating to the environment. All these, including the Tree Management Administration, all these were intended to go to DDOE. Why? There's a huge difference between looking at an urban forest and looking at the street trees. The urban forest comprises 7% of the district's trees, okay? The street trees. The street trees, correct, correct. The urban forest itself is much broader. It's a broader concept than that. And as a former street tree arborist, this is something that has taken 
decades for us to get out of. Why? Because street trees are beloved, as they should be, okay? They're the first things we see when we drive to work in the morning or walk to work in the morning or bike to work in the morning, and they're the last things we see at night, okay? So they are beloved as they should be, and we need to make sure that as UFA's mission stands, which is a great one, there need to be a lot of them, and they need to be healthy and well-maintained. More power to them. Okay? But we're talking about something much broader. We're talking about the environmental health that those trees provide, whether it's stormwater management, whether it's energy savings, whether it's particulate removal wells, whether it's wildlife habitat, and the list goes on and on and on. We cannot entrust that to an organization that is simply geared towards street trees and is, quite frankly, overtaxed within that agency as it is. DDOE needs to pick up this mantle. They need to achieve what's shown in the bill that created them. We need to foresee this vision. We need to make sure that that vision is realized. And I think we can do it with these simple changes that we're requesting here. One little tidbit that I think is kind of interesting. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. The 55 inches that, <clears throat> that, that was come upon as the limit for a special tree in the, in the first permit was come upon because Jim Dougherty, our friend at the Sierra Club, went out and said, what's a reasonable, what's a reasonable limit to protect or to put within this tree bill. And he went around and he just started hugging trees. And Jim's a pretty big guy. You know, I wish, it was, I wish it was my daughter doing this. You know, we would back that, that 29 inches. But, uh, and so that's how, that's how that 55 inches actually came about. It's, it's, and it's a true story. And we didn't have a lot of data back then. But since then, we've taken data. We know how many trees are out there. We know how much canopy is out there. We know the condition of those trees. We've done our homework. You should all be proud of that. It's time to use that information to figure out how big that tree is that we should hug. And we think it should be a little less than 55. Whether it's 40 or 29, I'm not sure. It's something to talk about. But I don't think it should be 55 anymore. So thank you very much.